involving the chimps in pain. They're used for hepatitis, they're used for AIDS. They don't get sick of those things. So what they have to endure is a few injections. And you can actually train a chimp to come and present his arm and he'll give you his blood. They're not just little machines. They have feelings and emotions and needs just as we do. So that the, the love of understanding and compassion used in training can make all the difference for these prisoners in the labs. The AIDS problem in this country is probably worse than any of us suspect. It's doubling here every 12 to 14 months. The number of new cases of AIDS is doubling. The, we're looking a little like looking at a star. What's happening, what we're seeing is something that happened many years ago. And, and the AIDS cases we're seeing now are really reflecting what happened in this country eight or 10 years ago. Uh, we think now that most of the people that are infected with the virus will probably develop the disease and die unless we develop uh, a treatment or a cure. The technology, time, and money devoted to AIDS research is enormous. The U.S. budget alone may well top $1 billion in 1989. Labs all over the world have shifted into high gear. Whoever wins the race to end AIDS stands to gain more than the gratitude of humanity. The potential profit is immense. But research has been frustrated by the failure of chimps to develop the disease, which can take eight years or perhaps longer to incubate. The first chimps were infected in 1983 at the Southwest Foundation in San Antonio, Texas. There are 35 AIDS carriers among the chimps inside these isolation units. Any outside contamination would ruin the experiments. So the infected animals are kept confined, alone or in pairs, for a year or longer. Animal behaviorist Linda Brent once wished to study chimps in the wild, following in the footsteps of women like Jane Goodall. For now, her work is of a very different nature. Working with infected animals, um, you know, you have to be very cautious. Um, obviously, if I was scared to death of it, I wouldn't be here. But um, basically, I'm trying to enrich the environment of the chimpanzees in isolation and also the other chimpanzees we have here. Um, Paul and James, you have been in isolation for quite a while, and uh, basically, they get bored. Um, boredom is probably, you know, one of the biggest problems with chimpanzees in isolation. So we've done some things to help. We've, um, they have large cages, so they have a lot of room to move around. Um, they can play and things like that. Uh, we just installed TVs in several of the huts so that they can watch TV. Maybe that will give them something to do. And also um, a very important aspect is um, just uh, caretakers being in there and um, working with the animals makes a big difference, the contact that they have. And that's probably one of the biggest reasons I'm here. I spend quite a bit of time in with all the animals, checking on them and taking data, things like that. When the chimps are released from isolation, they get their first taste of fresh air and sunlight in as much as two years. But because they carry AIDS, they can never be set free. Hi, Elsie. Be a good girl. Come on over here. Come here. The long internment causes some chimps to become pale and lose their hair, though they are not sick. Come here, Irving. They are permanent wards of the labs, and over a lifespan of 50 years, a single chimp can cost $250,000 to maintain. There are about 100 AIDS-infected animals now. But if a promising vaccine is found, many more will be needed for testing. Okay. Come here. There's been some concern expressed in the press in this country and among scientists about whether or not we have enough animals to really attack uh, this AIDS problem. If it appears that the problem gets worse and that we're going to need more chimpanzees, uh, the only solution uh, that I see that's really practical is for us to increase our efforts to breed them. Uh, we can produce uh, many more animals in this country with a large effort than we are now. People have suggested maybe we should go to Africa and get the chimpanzees. After all, there's still quite a few left there. Uh, most thinking researchers are not very comfortable with that solution. 
Facilities have begun breeding chimps in earnest because the import of the threatened species was widely restricted in 1975. But some experts doubt that captive breeding will ever be able to meet a surge in demand. There is pressure to circumvent the trade limitations, and in spite of them, U.S. import records show that 50 chimps were brought into this country between 1978 and 1986, eight of them specifically for scientific research. At this holding compound in the West African nation of Sierra Leone, one man is ready and able to supply wild-caught chimps to international buyers. Despite the 96-nation agreement to limit trade, Franz Sitter has recently sent chimpanzees to Europe and Japan. In the years prior to the restrictions, he also furnished the U.S. with almost all of its lab chimps. It was quite a big number which I exported during the years to America. I estimated uh, about 1,000, 1,500 chimps. And these chimps did quite um, well for America and for the American people, because imagine if the pharma industry in America would not have had these chimps, how could they have made all their, their medical research? How could they now work on AIDS? How could they have any breeding station from where they get now some baby chimps? These are all, 90% of these chimps in America are all Sierra Leone chimps. And these chimps which I exported did not endanger the species here because this is a number which is regularly caught in this country every year up till today. If Sitter's numbers are right, it's bad news for the chimps of Sierra Leone. A recent study estimates there are no more than 2,500 chimps left in the entire country. At Sitter's rates of capture, there would be none left here at all within two years. Even if he's wrong, the outlook isn't good. For every chimpanzee that reaches a lab alive, it is estimated that from five to 10 animals die during capture or later on from abuse, starvation, or despair. Infants are almost always taken by shooting the mothers. This young chimp's hand was mutilated by the wire trap used to snare it. But there can be an even worse fate for the primates of Africa. The meat of monkeys and chimpanzees is considered a delicacy in neighboring Liberia and elsewhere on the continent. It is estimated that 100 years ago, there were at least one million chimps in the wild. And today, there may be as few as 150,000. We may never have the chance to explore the limits of the chimpanzee's intellect. Only recently were wild chimps observed using rocks as hammers, an ability calling for reasoning power that approaches human thought. But the chimpanzees are as helpless against the superior survival skills of mankind as a Stone Age tribe would be against a modern army. When Explorer returns, we'll continue to investigate man's troubled relationship with the chimpanzee. Then we'll race down the streets of Manhattan with bicycle messengers. And there's much more to the world of ants than meets the eye. It's coming up after this. The following geographic moment is brought to you by the Discover Card. It pays to discover the card that pays you back.
purchase for a reminder. I've got to have it. There's still one more place to comparison shop. I don't know where to start. Here, by choosing the card that actually pays you cash, cash back for every charge, the Discover card. Mom, Mom. That's the one. It's perfect. It pays to discover the card that pays you back. You want to move one scout leader, six tenderfoot scouts, over a ton of trailer, and you want to be happy doing it. Hey, if it's important to you, it's important to Plymouth. It's the new Plymouth Voyager, with plenty of room, power, and highest customer satisfaction of American minivans, backed by 770 protection. The front-wheel drive Plymouth Voyager proves, yet again, the nine most important words Plymouth knows. Satisfy the customer. Satisfy the customer. Satisfy the customer. <laughs> Mobile communication it is the power to hold your world together. At GTE, we can put that power at hand to take with you where it has never gone before. Into the skies, down endless highways, beyond all past limitations. At GTE, we give you the freedom of personal communication and the power of new opportunities. Because at GTE, the power is on. If you're planning to move, you could unpack some great savings. Because now when you move yourself with Ryder, we'll enroll you in one of the country's biggest discount shopping services, absolutely free. Which means you can buy almost anything for your new home at some of the best prices around. So after you unpack, you can unwind with some great savings. Ryder, we're there at every turn. Greg, Greg, Mr. Belton wants to see you right away. Well, what'd you do? I don't know. So, Greg, when did you start hiring people to do your homework? Well, what do you mean, sir? I mean several of your teachers have brought these to my attention. This is way beyond the quality of work they're used to seeing from you. But, sir, I did those myself, on my computer. I know that, Greg, but what I need to know is... Yes, sir? What kind of computer? And now, back to National Geographic Explorer. Wild chimpanzees are found in only one area of the world, the lands of equatorial Africa. Little more than a century ago, they inhabited a wide band that stretched almost across the continent. But today, the population in West Africa has been almost eradicated, reduced by some 98% in only 100 years. The Thai National Park on the Ivory Coast is one of the few large forests remaining in West Africa. It was set aside for the conservation of wildlife, especially of chimps. But there is virtually no money to hire rangers to protect the animals. Research facilities are left to rot in the African forests. Equipment has been abandoned to rust. The park is a shambles and left vulnerable to poachers. Here, as elsewhere in Africa, there is little incentive for preserving what's left of the chimps' habitat. The timber industry brings in badly needed income. A single hardwood tree can be worth several thousand dollars. On a continent where millions of people are barely subsisting, the survival of chimpanzees runs a poor second. Even in a place that has become almost synonymous with chimps, problems exist. When Jane Goodall arrived in the Gombe Stream Reserve of what is now Tanzania in 1960, she was accompanied only by her mother and a cook and had funds for a six-month study. But word of her remarkable work with the Gombe chimpanzees spread, and financial support arrived from the National Geographic Society and other organizations. 
It soon became clear that the project was more than one individual, no matter how dedicated, could handle. The reserve became a national park, and over the years, more and more researchers and assistants arrived. When the results of Goodall's work were published, the chimps of Gombe began to be known around the world. Today, there are almost as many people as chimpanzees living in the area. Within the very boundaries of Gombe, the effects of human habitation are apparent. Villagers use timber from the region for firewood or to build furniture for their families. Every tree that is destroyed diminishes the room left for the chimps. The tourists arrive almost daily, increasing the cash flow and the crowds. Along with their backpacks and cameras and journals, they bring disease and place added stress on the vulnerable chimps. The animals are jeopardized by their own celebrity. As the chimps become ever more accustomed to human presence, their fear evaporates and aggression appears. This kind of attack is not only dangerous to humans, it increases the chimps' risk of exposure to disease. In 1987, Gombe lost nine out of its 45 habituated chimpanzees, probably to pneumonia. David Babu, director of Tanzania National Parks, is worried. Well, uh, let me... Uh it, it, let, let me explain a bit that uh, we have this crisis now. We have too many tourists, a lot of research is going on. Uh, you have access by the local residents who are doing a lot of illegal activities in the park. The infrastructure is right down, uh, is a crisis. The burden on the park and the park's chimps continues to grow. Since legal trade in chimpanzees is restricted, some American breeding facilities are resorting to elaborate and expensive techniques to ensure that plenty of healthy chimps are born in this country. All the latest obstetrical devices are used to track the progress of the fetus in this sonar scan. At birth, the newborn will be valued at $25,000. All right, we have the heart like you've seen, and we come on down a little further, and we have the fetal stomach as outlined by the cursor. And if you'll notice here, the umbilical artery or the umbilical cord coming into the abdomen. The Southwest Foundation for Biomedical Research has its own breeding program. Extreme precautions are taken with the delicate newborns to prevent infection. Infants which have been rejected by their mothers are cared for by Southwest personnel. Generally, exposure to people will be limited because the animals must learn mating behavior from adult chimpanzees, or they are likely to become poor breeders. The young chimps are released from the nursery when they are one year old and less susceptible to infection. They're raised in small peer groups designed to help them become well adjusted, but some still show signs of neurotic behavior, like rocking. The welfare of captive chimps is problematic for many facilities, including New Mexico's Primate Research Institute. 
Some of the animals here display marked anxiety. In an attempt to minimize it, they are allowed freedom and time to socialize within the lab. In order to raise healthier adults, caretakers like Patty Cooper are assigned to small groups. I've taken care of well over 200 chimps since I've been here. I, you know, raised them from birth until at least a year old. The affection lavished on these youngsters can make them easier to handle as mature chimps in the lab. I know that we're raising them for research purposes, and I know that. I'm always sad when they go, because each one of them are, are real special in their own way. They're all, you know, different, like people are. They're all individual. They make me feel real good inside. They, they give a lot of love, and all they want is, you know, you to take care of them. They, they count on you to take care of them. At the MD Anderson Cancer Center at the University of Texas in Bastrop, chimps live within these large octagonal compounds. The courtyard design provides large open spaces with plenty of room to exercise and play together. But though these animals may live in the best of all possible worlds for a captive chimp, the ultimate destination for many of their offspring is a steel cage in a laboratory. Most of the primate research and breeding programs in the United States are funded by the National Institutes of Health. It is the NIH, a government agency, which is chiefly responsible for setting policy concerning the care of both lab and breeder chimpanzees. At Bastrop, canine nannies assist in one of the most successful captive breeding programs in the country. The dogs provide companionship for rejected young chimps between visits from caretakers. The emphasis at Bastrop is on interaction rather than isolation, all in the interest of growing healthy, breeding chimps. Some AIDS research is carried on in the facility but the center is primarily dedicated to creating a self-sustaining colony which will supply chimps for other labs. The Bastrop chimpanzees get the best that money and expert advice can manage. They eat a varied diet presented in specially designed equipment and using ingenious techniques devised by staff members like animal behaviorist Dr. Molly Bloomstrand. Her goal is to keep the minds and hands of the chimps of Bastrop busy. The pipe feeder and other food puzzles are designed to increase the animal's activities such that their feeding will more closely resemble that of wild chimpanzees. In the wild, they spend about 60% of their day feeding and foraging, looking for food. And uh, we found in captivity, they spent a much smaller portion of their day feeding. So we give them tasks to perform uh, so that their feeding will take up more time. They'll have to spend, uh, they'll have to actually work at getting food items. And we try to simulate some of the uh, situations in which they feed in the wild. As in the wild, conflicts over food can break out when supplies become limited. We'll return to brutal kinship after these messages. You want to drive to the sun with the most features under the sun, but you don't want to pay a price that will burn you in the end. 
Hey, if it's important to you, it's important to Plymouth. Oh, wow. It's the new Plymouth Sundance with 47 standard features. Prices starting at $83.95. Best value in its class and backed by $7.70 protection. The Plymouth Sundance proves, yet again, the nine most important words Plymouth knows. Satisfy the customer. Satisfy the customer. Satisfy the customer. It's red. It's white. It's blue. It's beautiful! It's the American paradise. The United States Virgin Islands. Monday, it's... Dead brain cells. But will anyone notice? On 9 to 5, then B.O. is D.O.A. in Mayberry R.F.D. You sure do smell pretty. Thanks. On Andy Griffith, and it's a message from Esther. An ugly gram. <laughs> on Sanford and Son. A weekday funnies continue at 9 to 5, Monday at 6.35 Eastern on... Superstation TBS. Monday. National Geographic Explorer will return in a moment. Jack's the classic taste. Jack's the classic crunch. The classic taste that can't be beat. The real taste of corn, rice, and wheat. Jack's the classic crunch. This classic crunchy shape of Chex lets the milk burst through and the timeless taste stay in. Chex the classic crunch. A cheese riddle. Say, ma'am, what do you get when you add Monterey Jack cheese to plain chili? Happy cowboys. Cheese makes it taste even better, so don't forget the cheese. Want to take better pictures? Get the new Canon EOS 750. The only autofocus SLR with a flash like this and a system with computers and motors in every lens. Here, try it. Try the zoom. Easy, right? Well, that's EOS. New Canon EOS 750. Photography, pure and simple. Buy EOS today with no money down, low monthly payments at participating Canon dealers. Checking in. We interrupt this transaction for a reminder. The Discover card actually pays you cash back for every charge. Nice job, everybody. It pays to discover. And now back to National Geographic Explorer. It is not only in the United States that the care of captive chimps has become complex and costly. Come on, where are we? Is that a doctor, huh? Yeah. yeah. In Liberia, oh, an American-owned lab has wound up with a surplus population on its hands. Vilab, owned and operated by the New York Blood Center, is phasing out its use of chimps in hepatitis research. But it has been left with more than 150 animals which cannot be exported and are no longer capable of fending for themselves in the wild. The administrators of Vilab are faced with a responsibility they never anticipated. Dr. Alfred Prince, director of the facility, has lent his full support to the program. The need for chimpanzees is diminishing in every area except that of AIDS research, which we're not doing, so that we are looking forward to the eventual winding up of this laboratory as a, an experimental uh, primate laboratory. When we finally wind it down, our goal is to rehabilitate and release all of the animals in the colony. It's unlikely that we'll be successful in that. Some animals will not be releasable. But our goal is to, when we leave Africa, to have assured a future for all of the animals that have been in the program.
Caretakers travel daily to six different islands to feed the 102 chimpanzees that have been released in the first phase of the Vilab project. Very little food grows in this habitat, so the feedings of fruit and especially formulated bread are essential to the chimp's survival. The logistics of the operation are mind-boggling. There is no end in sight to the need for manpower, food, and equipment. Vilab has already spent more than half a million dollars taking care of these unneeded chimps. They have had unforeseen expenses like costly radio tracking collars, which were placed on the chimps after a number of the animals disappeared. Some of them are neurotic or seriously disturbed from their experience in captivity. It is unlikely they will ever be able to survive on their own. Familiarity with humans has also made them bold in their begging. Despite their surroundings, these animals are still captives shackled by their dependency on humans. Vilab would like to eventually release the animals from their islands into the wild. Ideally, they would find a national park which would accept them. But it will take at least five years for the animals to become self-sufficient, and even then, it is not known if space can be found. Feeding has become even more difficult on another of Vilab's islands. These animals have been here since 1978, but there is no place to move them. As they have reverted to their natural state, they have become dangerous and unapproachable, though no less dependent. All that protects the caretaker is the fact chimps are afraid of water and cannot swim. Adult chimpanzees weigh up to 150 pounds and are more powerful than a man. Their behavior is unpredictable and can become violent. Unwary visitors place themselves in a risky situation when they try to get too close to the island. Not only do chimps use tools for food gathering, but they have also learned to use weapons. Encroachment on their territory is perceived as a serious threat. The total area of the island these chimps live on is only 11 acres. When conflicts develop in the overcrowded forest, there is nowhere for the animals to escape. Several chimps have been killed in fights. There are more than 50 chimps still waiting for release, and the colony is still reproducing. The rehabilitation project is a huge drain on funds. If Vilab pulls out, the financially strapped country of Liberia may face a dilemma. What options will head of wildlife Alex Peel have for taking over the welfare of the chimps? Well, I wouldn't really know because uh, at the moment we have uh, no plans for these chimps and uh, we haven't found any, pro any solution to the problem yet. Uh, we have uh, been attempting to find solutions, uh, at least a place for uh, releasing these chimps 
and uh, if they were just uh, abandoned to us now, it would be serious. Uh, it would be a serious problem. Uh, there, there isn't a solution in sight, actually. So the Vilab chimps wait, either unsuitable for release or with no place to go. Brutal kinship continues when Explorer returns. This child is about to take a voyage. I'm Voyager. Want me to pick a dinosaur and have you guess which one it is? Yes. The dinosaur eats meat. Would you like to guess? No, not yet. The dinosaur is the size of a cat. It's a voyage beyond the three R's to the fourth R. Would you like to guess? Reasoning. Yes. Is it Saltopus? Yes. New Voyager for the fourth R. Reasoning from Texas Instruments. A cheese riddle. Hey, Mom, what do you get when you add grated Parmesan to ordinary vegetable soup? A super kid's lunch. Remember, cheese makes it taste better, so don't forget the cheese. Ask every American the meaning of success, and you won't hear the same answer twice. Whatever your idea of succeeding, Citicorp and Citibank can help. With Citibank MasterCard and Visa cards, Citicorp Savings, Diners Club, and Citicorp Mortgage. We also serve millions of customers in every major marketplace worldwide. Citicorp, because Americans want to succeed, not just survive. Here at Viadent, we make an excellent anti-plaque toothpaste. How we make it is a little unusual. What's unusual is this, the Sanguinario Root. It's a fantastic ingredient, and it's ours exclusively. And it's the plaque cleaning power in Viadent. In university lab tests, it's been shown to be effective against 98% of major kinds of plaque bacteria. This might not be so pretty, but brushing with Viadent works like crazy. And to us, that's beautiful. Viadent, the anti-plaque specialists. This is the first time Wayumpi Indians had ever been filmed. They had never seen red hair or anything like a pathfinder. Here on the equator, the air conditioner was a big hit. And I'm pretty sure they liked our music. But you know what? We decided we liked their music even more. Will people go for the taste of new Wheaton brand Triscuit just as much as regular Triscuit? It would so appear. New Wheaton brand Triscuit. And now back to National Geographic Explorer. The process of retraining captive chimps to survive in the wild is far from an exact science. Janice Carter arrived in the Gambia 11 years ago with a chimpanzee named Lucy, who became the first chimp raised by humans to be reintroduced into the wild. Back in Oklahoma, Janice had helped take care of Lucy and grew as close to her as her adoptive parents. At the age of 11, Lucy was no longer manageable. It was decided to give her a chance at freedom. When Lucy arrived at a chimp rehabilitation camp operated by Stella Brewer, Janice came along to help in the readjustment. She planned to spend only a few weeks retraining her friend, but the weeks turned into months, which turned into years. In the end, however, Lucy succeeded, trading in her American upper middle class lifestyle for the wilds of Africa. The program continues today. Other chimps in need of rehabilitation have been sent to Carter. Each animal requires a great deal of individual attention and time. These chimps, rescued from smugglers, traders, and abusive owners, give Carter all she can handle. I think one of the first lessons I learned is that you can't just release an animal from a cage and expect them to adjust to an environment that they were not raised in. And there was a lot of question 
about whether Lucy could make the transition because she was an adult when she was released. Most of her behavior patterns were already fixed for a different environment. And Lucy did make the adjustment. It did take a long period of time in comparison with the wild caught chimps. But she did, she did make the adjustment. And I think the major thing that we've learned from this work is that rehabilitation in terms of the chimps adaptation to the wild is technically feasible. Whether it's economically feasible in terms of human energy, time and money is another question. You're too big. You're too big. Hexel, come on, you're too big. Hex. Uh -oh. The chimps demand a tremendous amount of patience and ingenuity. But the result is often healthy and playful animals. Carter operates her rehabilitation camp on a shoestring budget of $10,000 a year. It barely pays for food for the chimps, and there is practically nothing left over for even basic supplies for Carter herself. Eleven years dedicated to rehabilitating 35 chimps. The commitment is admirable. But how many Janice Carters are there in the world? Many experts believe that adequate protection of wild chimpanzees would be a more effective practice than the long and arduous process of rehabilitation. There is little time for reflection about the special bond between Janice and Lucy, who died in 1986. But there are moments when the memories return. It makes me look back to the beginning. And why I came out here was Lucy. And why I stayed here so long was because of Lucy. But I know that, that I offered Lucy a life as a wild chimp. In a sense, um, Lucy's death does release me a little bit from my responsibility to the project. It was because of my affection for Lucy that I started the project. And it, that was the reason that I stuck through it as long as I did, because Lucy needed me that long. Janice Carter still visits Lucy's grave, a small and simple memorial to a treasured friendship between two close relatives. Lucy was fortunate. She got her chance to return to the wild. There are thousands of chimps which today are captives of human society. In our quest to dominate the world and protect our own, what have we wrought on our sibling species? What do we owe those that have made immeasurable contributions for the benefit of mankind? The vaccines for both polio and serum hepatitis were developed using chimpanzees. Now, they are in the front lines of the fight to conquer AIDS. On the shores of Lake Tanganyika, Jane Goodall continues to probe the body, mind, and spirit of the chimpanzee. Having come to know them so well, she cannot look away. During the last few years, I've become increasingly aware of the problems that are facing chimps. And I suspect that never have they faced so many crises before. In Africa, in many parts, they're being exterminated. And in some cases anyway, their situation in the labs is quite appalling. Fortunately, it does seem that people are becoming far more aware of these problems. And I think that therein lies our hope for the future. Because there are things we can do, there are things we must do. And certainly speaking for myself, I propose to devote the rest of my life 
to fighting for these improvements for the chimps. Does it lessen our own humanity if we ignore the sufferings of a creature which we can surely recognize as our cousin? In a hundred years, will these bones be all that remains of a species that was just beginning to shine with the light of reason? The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service must come to a decision by November 4th on a petition to change the status of the chimpanzee from threatened to the more serious category of endangered. If the animal is reclassified as endangered, it will no doubt heat up the already intense controversy over using chimps in medical experiments.